Welcome back. Sorry for the technical issues. Tech issues. They follow me around like gremlins. We are we are setting up the um, the studio here, so bear with us. It's fine. Yeah, it's it's meant to be light. Well, this is where you start to say that. This is authentic. Yeah. Things yeah. are going wrong. No, absolutely. On. <laughs> it's definitely authentic esports right now. That's for sure. Okay. Um, so I, we were talking about. Um, wait, let me let me just let everyone know. All right. Back okay. Up. All right. That's a good idea. Let's let's do that. Uh, so sorry, I'm looking at my phone. That's yeah, no, that's fine. Um, will you do that, and I'll talk, and then I'll retweet once I've finished. Um, we were talking about uh, Mr. Lewis Prosser, aka uh, a guy called Playful, who I used to play against back in the day, and I'm real talking about probably like 15 or 16 years ago. Um, he's a very good player back in the day. Um, we were talking about is the FPS genre, specifically the one v one FPS genre, is it dead? And I, and I don't think it is dead but it's definitely on life support it might even be given the last rights right now um if it was being visited by the local priest but it i don't necessarily think it's dead and we were talking about um and i don't know if you've got this on the stream so i'll just repeat it for those that were there uh, that weren't there or didn't hear it for me it's about there's a, a, a multifaceted skill level within 1v1 fps is you have the mental strategical capacity at one level which you don't really know about unless you play the game and you understand it so that's difficult but it's it's reliant on good commentators like joe miller like um dj week to get that across and explain to you at home why it's so clever that this player has particularly done this thing in game and it's a it's a mixture of things it's as you well know as a former 1v1 player it's, it's map control but it's not just map control in terms of i've got this item and i've got this rocket launcher and i've got this rail gun or whatever it's more about where is the other player on the map right now and how can I deny them the resources that they need? And if you're the other player, it's about how can I get back into the game and get map control back by manipulating this player to think I'm in this place, but actually I'm in this place right now. Plus you're thinking about timing in your head. So I would time maybe two or three items. This guy would probably time like five items and a rail gun or something. Time all the items, yeah, sure. Exactly, you see what I mean? <laughs> um, and then on top of that, you've then got the actual base level of skill to play the game, which is aim, uh, prediction, um, placement, understanding of weapons, map, understanding and awareness, environment awareness. There's so much else stuff. But like when you say all of those things, suddenly you go, yeah, it, like 1v1 FPSs should be like fucking awesome to watch. They really should, shouldn't they? When you think of all those things that are involved, you don't get that in, in Dota, you, different set of skills. You don't get it in League of Legends or Overwatch or any of these other things. You, it's a very unique set of skills, I think, to 1v1 FPS games. I think you probably extend it to Counter-Strike a little, Overwatch a little here and there, but, but all of those skills combined, there is no other game I know of that you need all of those things. Like, when someone first told me, I think it was probably like 97 or 98, and I was playing Unreal Tournament at the time, it was in a beta, and we were playing Quake 3 a lot, and Quake 2 before that with Puri, but it was Unreal Tournament that made me go, like, people were saying, like, well, don't, don't you time the app? And I'm like, what do you mean? It spawns every 35 seconds. And I'm like, right. What do you mean, time it? He's like, well, do you not count the seconds in your head while you're playing? I'm like, I'm too busy trying to run around <laughs> the bloody map! I'm too busy trying to aim at this guy who's across the other side of the map trying to fire rockets at me. I, like, how am I supposed to think? But then when you train yourself, actually, you find yourself compartmentalizing your brain. Mm. Like, this part of my brain is timing this item and that item. This part of my brain is understanding where I am in the map. This part of my brain is working out where the other player is. And this part of my brain is dealing with aim. And, and then you've got to have a little bit more, because if you're playing TDM or CTF, you've got to be able to talk. <laughs> so it's like, holy crap, that's a lot of skills. Yeah, I think I ran out. That's why I never did TV. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a CTF player. I've yeah. had it easier. Well, so when I was playing Quake, God, we're talking about old things again. Well, we'll move on from yeah, this, yeah. by the way. But let's just, let's just finish Don't expect us to talk I, about some old stuff occasionally. I, I want to talk about this. Um, it becomes habit. It becomes habit it very does. quickly yeah. when yeah. you have uh, a 30 second and a 25 second timer. Yeah which doesn't work actually combine very nicely sometimes. Quake had these odd times. It does, yeah. It becomes so instinctive actually after a while. And so part, partly you're technically looking at the clock and saying, yeah. okay, the next one is at this time yeah. and burning it into your yeah. mind and knowing like when 10 seconds is gonna be, in, 10 seconds before the red armor spawns, I need to know because I need yeah. to sort of position yeah. myself. 
but you also yeah. you would then find like on on uh, DM6 for instance you would know that from one point to another point was seven seconds by yeah. bunny jumping that's across the, the map right so you but that would become instinctive as yeah. well yeah but okay but here, here's what we're going I think I think you're right I think Quake is almost a perfect game and right and and it's always we're always wondering as a Quake player why is it not big because it's not yeah. big it's not as big as Counter Strike yeah. it's not as big yeah. as MOBAs and I think what it comes down to is that people aren't playing it as much, yeah. right? And you have to play the game to appreciate the skill. Yeah. I think it's the same goes for Dota, League of Legends. If you don't play the game, it's so hard. Yeah. It's so hard to follow what's going on and sure. watch a big but final. I, I don't know. I think you can... I think there's... There's a simplicity to it, too, as well. I mean, when you look at Counter-Strike... Counter-Strike is a difficult game to play. Counter-Strike is a game which... Um, our studio is falling apart. Uh, <laughs> no one needs to know what's happening. Behind. Cover up production mistakes, nothing happened. Um, Cap Strike's a tough game. It's a really hard game to get very good at, right? The skill level is super high. The skill ceiling is very high. Um, the entry level is relatively easy. I think the problem that Quake and, and Unreal Tournament and all of those kind of games had is that they're not that easy to get into, hmm. right? At least understanding the game, as we've just explained for the last five minutes, it's, it's quite tough sometimes to understand all of the elements that you need to be... Like, you can watch a player going around a map and you go, oh, I can do that. And that's a demo, right? But actually replicating it, that's a whole different thing because you're not in their mind. You don't understand what they're thinking about and why they're thinking about certain things around the map unless you understand 1v1 FPS on a high level. Hmm. So... I think it's difficult to get into those games or harder to get into those games than it is, say, Overwatch or Counter-Strike, for instance. But I do think it's easy to watch. I mean, think about the simplicity of a scoreboard saying 10-4. Like, you don't have to understand rocket launchers or any of the things we've just talked about. It's 10-4. Like, how easy is that compared to, say, Dota or StarCraft or League of Legends, where if you don't know the games, watching it for the first time, you're just like... I have no idea what's going on right now. Like the scoreboard says five one, so I guess they're winning. Well, no, actually, yeah. the other team have got more. We've been here before, yeah. right? So it's hard to understand. A, it's not that hard to understand a one v one game or a CTF game for that matter. You know, it's three zero to this team. Yeah, CTF is a great. Well, I think model CTF is the most esports. underrated esports mode right now. I think there isn't anything. If we had a great game, it could be an Overwatch, it could be a Fortnite, it could be an Unreal Tournament, it could be Quake, it could be any of those games mm. that come back that have a popular community behind them. I think CTF is the team-based game that could take off, that isn't currently taking off anywhere. And, and part of that reason is, is that then you've got the FPS genre back involved, right? Which I don't think is dead, but I think 1v1 might be. And the problem with that is because most of the successful esports nowadays are all team-based. There's very few that are solo games. You know, things like FIFA, for instance, that's 1v1, that's, that's a solo game. Starcraft, 1v1 game. But even then... Clash those, Royale. Clash Royale. The, <laughs> but those games are not big right now. They're yeah. not bringing in big stream numbers. They're not bringing in big sponsors. They're not bringing in big sponsorship money. They're not bringing big, big prize money. So it's tough for all of those things. And I, I think there is room for it, for sure. But I, will it come back? I don't know. Like I said, I think the priest is in there giving, giving 1v1 FPS is the last rights. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, well... I want to move on to the main topics, actually. Now that the stream is live, indeed. Welcome back, everyone. I hope uh, we didn't draw, drive people away with this, but we'll, we'll recall, we'll, we'll clip all this. Yeah, of, uh, yeah, we'll fix it in post. Don't worry, it'll be fine. So, uh, yeah, this is the Luckbox podcast number two, and it's Friday the thirteenth. So, yeah, I want to talk about luck because this this is one thing. I bought would... some luck last week. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely did buy some luck. Not that kind of luck. You're thinking of it, some luck coin. That, that's yeah, the, the luck box indeed. token. Indeed it is, yeah. yes. But you can't use it yet. because No, I know. I'm, I'm yet, still waiting. I, I can't wait to, to, to get involved in it. But soon. anyway, yes. Um, so talking about luck in general. Yeah. Right. This is the thing. We're talking about why Quake is not a big eSport. Yeah. I think there's very little luck in Quake, right? What do you so hear me out. You were lucky. Okay. <laughs> hear me out. <laughs> Uh, so if you want if you want to win a game of Quake, yes. you don't get a lucky shot and win that game. You do get lucky shots. Okay, just just let, let me let me go no, through my reason. Have you not seen the Levitation movie? <laughs> the Levitation movie from the year two thousand, one of the godliest. Go and look it up on Google right now. Levitation movie from Unreal Tournament, one of the greatest early frag movies from the early two thousands you'll ever likely watch. Not biased at all because I played for Levitation. Not biased at all. Um, in it. 
there's a little thing in it which says luck is greater than skill. I know, but that's just. And it's also in the Foos movie as well. The, that's one the of Foos the... movie, also one of the greatest early frag movies. Go look up Foos. F O O Z E. Foos movie for Quake. Uh, mate, uh, for I'm talking, absolutely amazing. All right, but uh, what, what I wanted to say was that the variance in Quake yes. is very small. Okay. Did you ever hit a lucky air shot with a rocket? No, it was all. Liar! <laughs> Liar! You right, hit right. many rocket shots on but, me that were okay. luck. Okay, so all games have a certain amount of luck. Yes. I would argue that um, games like Quake, yeah. if you're a worse player, you will lose 99 times out of 100. Yes, most I would agree with that. If you're a lot worse, you'll lose 999,999 sure. yeah. times out of 100. But you'll get lucky at some point and win okay. a game. But it's actually rare in Quake, whereas something like poker, on the other side, Sure. You can get lucky from time yeah. to time. Now, yeah. actually, on average, you don't win money, like, which is why right. it works. But, you, but poker. with poker, you still need to understand the principles of the game to get lucky, though. So you could call that luck and skill. Because if I'm, I could get a I'm, hand I'm, that's I'm, got, like, you know, a royal flush hand, but not now I've got a royal flush. I'm not arguing that, that poker is a skill game. It's okay. certainly a skill game. You can see that yeah. by, by who wins. But not as skilled as Quake. No, I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying when you introduce luck into a game, it becomes easier for new players to be introduced to uh, And I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I, but I, would di I think there's different types of luck, right? There's luck in terms of... I know this map really well, and I know that players tend to jump off this ledge to this box. I'm going past the window where I go, oh, if he's jumping off right now, I'll fire a rocket so that when he lands, it will hit him. Fine. That's luck as well as skill. Those it's are probability not, shots. Yeah, it's probability, fine. right? It, yeah. It's prediction, probability, call it what you want, but there's luck involved in it. I don't mind that luck, and I don't think you don't mind that. What mm. I don't like is the RNG kind of luck that yeah. you get with like a crit in Dota, for instance. I don't like that kind of RNG because I can't do anything about it. It's skillless. I'm basically relying on the game deciding not to send 996 damage to my character right now because then I live and I ult him, yeah. right? And if the RNG is strong enough on his side and he fires this one thing off that's completely skillless, by the way, because he's just clicking on me, or, or he's doing a global, yeah. that's even worse, by the way. Global RNG is absolutely hideous in any game, including Dota. But he can do that and I can die. That changes the outcome of that play and therefore the rest of the, I don't like that RNG. And that is absolute luck and I'm with you. Yeah, there's... The pro gamers are always complaining about the yep. bash percentage on Spirit yep. Breaker. You know, you, you might be PA and you go into a fight and it's like, why have I got no crits? I've taken 10, 10 attacks, yep. no crits. Yep. And as a pro player, you don't, you kind of don't want it. No. But I think you need that luck. You need to give people a chance who haven't mm. played before and they suddenly have this legendary moment where they're, they're playing and it's like... Uh, how much like, Overwatch have you played? Uh, a little. Okay. So I play a Farrah main a lot, yep. and I'm relatively good at it. I'm not outstanding at it, but I'm 3K, I'm okay level. One of the most frustrating things about playing her is that she can be countered by an awful lot of other heroes in the game. Probably more heroes in the game than any other hero that can counter her. You know, pretty much name any hero and she can get countered. Mercy, in battle mode, can counter a Farrah, no problem <laughs> at all. That's absurd when you think about the dynamics of the two heroes, right? Mm. That's absolutely absurd. The worst one, however, has to be, for me, has to be a mixture of either Winston or Genji. Now, for two different reasons. One is Winston is no skill, no aim. It's jumping around following things whilst holding down the mouse button where electrical rods of pulse go into the yeah. body of something I, I, else. I'm not a fan of... Total RNG! Yeah. No aim, no skill, nothing, right? So don't even argue with me about that. The other one is Genji. Is a skilled character. Very hard the, to the play. Very hard to play, right? However, his deflect... I mean, how RNG is that, right? I'm, I'm somewhere else on the map. He's fighting somewhere else. I fire a rocket. He flicks around, does his thing, and it reflects back into one of my other players on my team. Like, come on now. Okay. So, I don't know. Are there acceptable levels of RNG? I think there has to be some level so that new players can get a taste. But it'll always of... frustrate players that have played the game or have a decent understanding well, I think of there's FPS. a balance, and I, I think you want... You want new players yeah. to have I mean, to be fair to Overwatch, it is easy to get into. You can... Like, I've had Dota friends who've come over and played Overwatch because they've been convinced by the, oh, but I've not got very good aim and I don't, I don't do very well with weapons. We don't need one. And they're like, oh, really? And they, yeah, just 
hold down left and out and Winston <laughs> and run around. And they're like, oh, really? That easy? Yeah. And then they play it and they go, holy crap, it is easy. And then they get to a level where actually it starts getting harder because yeah. you match players who understand the countering aspects of the game, what works in what situation, mm. when to use an ulti, how to combine it with someone else in your team, how to work off a different team, how to change hero to counter something else they've got. They start to understand that and then the game becomes more intricate. But it's easy to get into. And I've always said esports, I think the majority of esports that work and have worked over the years, CS being one of those, StarCraft, Brood War, Warcraft 3, Quake 3, Unreal Talk, or any of the early stuff, and the, and the stuff that's come out now, have two definitive key markers for me. And they are this, high skill ceiling level, easy yep. to get into. Those are the two critical elements of any decent esports right now. Look at all of them right now. There isn't a single esport out there that doesn't involve those two things. So. If that means RNG to make it easy to get into, but it doesn't hurt the very high level players at the top end too much, I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah, and, and my view is that you get these magical moments in gaming where everything works out just right. Yeah. And everyone needs to feel that, that surge of joy from like something yeah. amazing happening and you feel like I mean, a ninja you, in the game. You've, um, you've no doubt seen Cold Zero's jumping orb shots, right? Yeah. On the ledge, on Mirage. Now, it is an incredible piece of action, it is an incredible piece of skill, but it's also an incredible piece of random luck. Yeah. He would admit that as well, it's like well, yeah. saying anything There's else. No he is lucky the way that he's used together. those unscoped jumping shots, like they're just, there's a mixture of luck, aim, practice, prediction, there's all sorts in there, but there is an element of luck in it mm. to hit that many shots, and it's probably why we'll never see anything like it again. But those are magic moments. Yeah. Can't take him away from that. Doesn't devalue the skill level involved. Doesn't devalue him. Doesn't devalue the moment. But there is some random luck involved in that. Yeah. Uh, I, so sometimes it can be great. Yeah. Um, so the other, the next subject we want to talk about. Yes. And uh, let me. I've run out of coffee, by yeah, the way. Let's take a little, a second, because I'm I'm just checking, yeah, right. but because of the technical issues and so on, I'm just checking that we are actually still live. Yeah, I should probably. And. Uh, and Old Red Eye's back, apparently. And for, for the luck box guys who are helping me out, I'm talking to Tim, so uh, send everything via Tim yes. if I need to be told anything like that. Mm. Um, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm just retweeting stuff to, to help, that's all. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so, so the next subject I wanted to talk about, because I've just come back, from Cologne. You have? Yeah, how was that? So ESL1 Cologne was It's a great, week. great experience. Now, I, I brought along some of the, the Luckbox team were there and a couple of them had never been to Cologne before. Right. So the exciting thing about bringing them to this event, I think it's the loudest esports event. I, I, I don't know, you're gonna, are you mm. gonna disagree with me? It's the loudest one I've ever been to. Okay. I mean, Birmingham was pretty damn loud. Yeah, they, it was pretty damn loud, but I tell you the loudest is Manila. Okay, okay, yeah. fine. All of Asia was 20,000 unbelievably loud, passionate Filipinos going crazy wild. Well, I've never been that deaf inside an <laughs> arena before. I, I'm going to have to go to Manila. Yeah. But there is something special about... No, ESL there absolutely is about ESL One Cologne. It, it has a, uh, a vibe. I've been very lucky um, to have hosted it a few times and... Obviously, I dubbed it the Cathedral of Counter-Strike, which they now use in all of their... Oh, uh, does their, that come from it you? It does. It was something I said on the stage. I was talking to the guys backstage beforehand, and I said to them, guys, how, how do you feel about... I was going to do... Oh. Part of my introduction was going to be, you know, welcome to the Cathedral of Counter-Strike, and they were like, ooh, that sounds good. And I was like, you don't, you don't think it's too religious? And it's getting, like, borderline weird? And they were like, no, 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 it's fine. So, okay, so we went out and we used that the first time. I think it was 16, I think I used that. Um, and they've used it in all their literature, which is kind of nice. Um, but it goes back to the feeling, that's how I felt about it. It felt like a pilgrimage. It felt like people would come along to a venue which was special in some way. I can't place my finger on why it's special, it just is special. The reason it was special for us at ESL at the time when I worked for ESL was because it was, the, it was always the arena that I went past on the way to the office. And it was always the arena that Sven and I in particular um, talked about and said one day we, we're going to put an esports event on in there god damn it we're going to put an esports event on it it was one of those kind of driving forces from six seven years ago for us and probably longer for people like ralph um at esl was that we we wanted to be in there like we saw all these big names go in there we saw the justin Bieber's of the world going in and we were like we've got to get esports in there somehow and when we did spodek it was kind of like that was the first time we ever did an arena on our own 
that was the moment where I think we all thought, okay, we can do this now. Like, not only can we do it from an ability point of view, but we can do it from a enough crowd comes along to these things now, fills an arena and a stadium, so we can definitely do this. And so when we got to go into the Land Access Arena and deliver an esports event, that's why it felt special to a lot of people inside the organisation. And I think it got shared by the players, it got shared by the crowd, it was a very... Um, everyone just enjoyed that event and obviously it's well produced and people online watch it as well and they, they feel that vibe I think come through so from the very first time we ever went in there um, right up to this year's I'm sure you experienced something similar that just has an atmosphere that's all of its own it's it's very special yeah uh, sorry to everyone at home we seemed we froze for a bit we'll be oh. back again yeah. more technical it's Friday the 13th this happens um, never do a live show on Friday the 13th <laughs> that's what they said yeah well, I, I think I think what's telling about that is because ESL were always based in Cologne, yeah, and that arena is iconic. You know, Gamescom is right around the yeah. corner, the Cologne Mess, and and this is this is the arena. It's amazing. The Lanxess Arena looks incredible from the outside. Yeah. Um, it was so loud inside, yeah. and on Saturday night there was a game being played, Big versus Phase. Yeah, now. That was one of the most incredible moments I think I've ever experienced in esports. Right? Really? Because uh, FaZe are obviously huge favourites. Yeah. There. You know, probably to win as well. Yeah. And Big, I think they've been written out. This so it's Berlin International Gaming, um, not that uh, well known in Counter Strike. No. Maybe top thirty. Uh, something yeah, like probably. That. I mean, they've had flashes. They've had flashes yeah. of moments. They had some. Uh, they got good minor last year and, yeah. and got to the major and did very well at the major, knocking out some big teams along the way as well. So they're not unknown, um, but they're not. You know, definitely not considered top. Or weren't considered top eight in the world. That's for sure. And and it was controversial when ESL gave them a direct invite. A lot of people said they didn't deserve to be there, yeah, and I think they proved a lot of people wrong. And obviously the biggest news is that in the last six months they've taken on a British player, yeah. which, you know, it's a, a multi-international German-based organisation as it is, but um, they took on probably the best player we've produced in a decade, if not a generation, in Counter-Strike, um, a guy called Smuya, um, which, yeah, just for full disclosure we rep by the way at Code Red so oh, okay. you know, we're, you know, we're very much invested in the fact that he does well we want him to do well but he is an absolute talent there's no doubt about that and I know that he's been frustrated over the last couple of years in various lineups and teams that he's played in but I think he's finally found a home now that he can have friends in that he can enjoy playing in and that can match his ambition and his skill level and, and the fact that we've got a British player playing at the major in fact we've got two by the way i'll come to the second one in a moment um the fact that we've actually got a british player at all playing at the major is a huge step forward for this for this yeah. area and this region of esports because we've notoriously not done very well over the last five years so i, I think it's i've been in i've been in panels and talks and it's been hard to name a player sure who yeah. stand out a uh, uk yeah. player i mean majority of the ones right i use um, we've got decent call of duty players we've been very blessed to have those for the last 10 years um, we've got world finalists in Call of Duty. We've got European champions in uh, Heroes of the Storm. Um, we've got good FIFA players, fo world champions, former world champions, mm -hmm. and we've won F1 Esports last year as well. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, we're struggling. We, we've got a few fight game stars, but they're, you know, they've been yeah. around a little while. I mean, and, without but, without but putting them Counter Strike, down, League of Legends, Dota, where are they? Yeah. Right? Yeah, without putting them down, there's there's the tier one esports. Yeah. Which are, I think, yeah. I mean, like... Uh, I With know, CSGO, LOL, Dota, maybe and, Overwatch. And it's not, it's not saying the other games are bad. They're no. not. They, they all have their own scenes and communities. But the viewership, the prize money, and, yeah. the, and as a result, the glory, yeah. it tends to be in those games. It does, yeah. Um, for better or worse. Yeah. Uh, so now, but we but have, we have a, two in the major yeah. now. We have Death from Complexity. Complexity are back in, which I'm really pleased for them. We've got a lot of friends over there as well. So they're back at the major. So we have two UK players, bona fide good players, and potentially great players who are both playing at the UK major in September okay. at Wembley, which is amazing. Like it's fantastic, and that I hope helps the young kids, you know, the boys and girls that are going to school right now in college that look up to these these guys as role models, as people that they want to emulate later on. You, know, you and I grew up maybe thinking we were going to be footballers or something. The, you know, Today's kids are growing up thinking they want to be esports superstars, they want to be players, they want to be professional players in whatever various games. I hope that having 
two UK players to root for at the UK major now inspires some of these young players. And that over the next five to ten years, we can start improving those players and bringing them through and putting them on really good teams in tier one games as well. Well, here's the thing we wanted to talk about then. Yeah. So it's a UK major coming up in September and they've got two UK players. Yeah. Now I can tell you in Germany with big playing, yeah. they got they got the crowd going yeah. a little bit. Well, yeah, I would expect <laughs> I would expect that. I lived in Germany for a few years yeah. and I, I, um, I'm being obviously sarcastic there. Yeah, no, no, the no, crowd was roaring. I mean every it's funny time though, isn't it? because they did I anything. think I think the UK people that haven't experienced Europe or beyond very much think that the Germans are very boring and very mechanical and very straightforward and they don't really show their emotions. That can be further from the truth. <laughs> like I know lots of passionate German people. Like they, they love their, their teams and their players doing well and they've been very blessed over the years to have a lot of players. Unfortunately, though, in the last three or five years, not so much, right? Quake back in the Quake days, God damn it, if we played Germans, it was well, we'd probably lose because they're all bloody good. <laughs> Right? They were all bloody good at the game. So these days, not so much. Like, I think if you're a Counter-Strike player, you probably come up against a German team and just went, don't care. It's like coming up against the UK team, whatever. But yeah. big have changed things a little bit because they've, they've done well. But I think the German esports fans have the same kind of hunger for success that we do in the UK. Mm -hmm. right? They're like, I want our team to win because we just haven't seen any success for a long time. So I'm, I'm not surprised that they got you know, really loud and Larry and, and, and cheered every frag and every round and every victory so um, and it, I, I think it, it's good it, it helps the team for sure so I'm sure big yeah I think it does I mean look well, Thorin spoke about this the other day I haven't had a chance to watch his um, his podcast but I know that some of his views in the past is that he's not really cared too much for this whole home team mentality thing and how much does it impact I, I think it does I mean look at any sport right I'm going to take you back on history Bit of a history thing. I'm an F1 nut, obviously. Um, 1987, I want to say, um, Silverstone, and Mansell and PK are in the Williams Honda, and they're by far the quickest cars. Like they, they were the quickest cars that year, but in that particular race, they were just in a race of their own. Those two cars. Mansell had to pit quite late. I think it was a something went wrong with his car, but it wasn't it wasn't deadly. I think it was like a tire or a wheel nut or something. Which they changed was this again? 87. It's 86 or 87. Um, it was at Silverstone, so I think it was 87. They changed his tyre with about 12 laps to go, and he was like 25 seconds behind Nelson Piquet. There's just no way he was going to win this race. But it's the British Grand Prix. It's at Silverstone. It's Nigel Mansell. It's Mansell mania. There's 120,000 people screaming his name every time he goes past them, and he can hear them in his cockpit, even though <laughs> the engine is so freaking loud that it's bursting his eardrums, but he can still hear the crowd over them, right? That's incredible. They egged him on. He said he gained a second a lap thanks to the crowd. And he doesn't even know to this day where that second lap came from because he drove beyond where he thought the limit was. But he caught Nelson Piquet and passed him down the hangar straight and went on to win the race. And then his engine melted down on the last lap, so the crowd engulfed him. Now, you can't tell me that, that guy didn't get something from racing on home soil and then having the crowd roaring him on. He got something from it, right? I don't know what it is. It's very intangible. I can't measure it. I can't tell you what it actually physically looks like, but he got something from it. That was the first time I realised that that kind of thing would help. And it was partly then I started reading history. England winning the World Cup in 1966 on home soil is no fluke, right? There is a reason that more World Cups have been won by teams on their home soil than any other teams. The only team that, that don't do it are Brazil, weirdly, because they were brilliant everywhere. It didn't matter whether they were in a home country or not. But the majority of them, home teams do better. Russia this year exceeded all expectations. They were the lowest ranked team in the World Cup out of 32 teams, yet they reached the last eight. Yep. They did that because players were playing in Russia. They're proud of that. They want to do their country well. They want to do their fans well. They don't want to let them down. Now, I don't know why that elevates them and why they can't use that to then play the same in a different country. That's the thing that, that baffles me. Why can't you bottle that somehow? and say, I'm going to do it for the same reason somewhere else. So my argument is, is it must happen in eSports. It must. We don't know, though. We know it works We don't know, but it must, right? Um, it's the well, same theory. I mean, we can look at results and say, sure. he got to the semi-finals and played Na'Vi in the finals and gave them a fairly good yeah. fight. Yeah, if they the do finals. nothing for the rest of the year, do mm. we then put that down to the fact they were playing on home <laughs> soil in a German arena in front of a German crowd? Yeah. See, I'd like to chime in from my own experience, but uh, I'll tell you this. 
uh, I never played in a big UK event. Really? No, we I didn't guess not, because we didn't really have those so kind of I things. So I was always the outsider. Um, but you played in America, you played in Sweden, you played all over Europe. Yeah, that, those are not home games. No. Right. So it never really occurred yeah. to you that you might... But do you, let me put this to you then. Do you think if they'd had... That is CPL London. Are you not playing the CPL London? The CPL Sheffield was too late, wasn't it? That was later. Yeah, it was... Yeah, it was later on. I think it was over five. I think it was Painkiller anyway, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, do you then not think that if you'd had a CPL, as it was, because they were the majors effectively back then, a CPL in the UK for Quake, that you would have somehow performed better? It's a good question, and it's hard to say. What I think happens in esports is that as a player, you play a certain way, you have a certain skill level, you're at a certain level, but when you play live, the, the problem is you can't play at your highest level. So the question is, is how close do you get to that level? Mm. And often, you know, the mistakes you make are because there's so much pressure on you. Right. So imagine you're a small team that, that gets to the main stage final. All of a sudden, you're nervous and you, you realize there's so much pressure on you. It's like it's everything you ever dreamed of yeah. becomes possible now. And the pressure is huge right. and it's, it's difficult. And then it becomes difficult to think straight, to, uh, to aim properly if you're playing a, an FPS, to all of your mechanical talents like you may have practiced this over and over again but it is difficult and it is the only the very 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 tier one best teams who can play at their top level when they're under that pressure and that mm. that's maybe what defines them as as those top teams right um now the question is can you get a boost from from the home yeah. team advantage from the crowd cheering you on i don't know I just, yeah i mean i, I it's difficult, isn't it? Because I often also thought, if this were because likewise, you know, I grew up in an area where we didn't mm. have stadium events, we were just doing LAN parties, but the, the closest we would get would be the I-Series finals when we play on a small stage, right? Now, that in itself was quite, that was quite nervous. Mm. It was quite, you know, whoa, hello, we've got a small crowd of 50 people watching this and maybe a couple of hundred people watching on there. That was quite nervous, right? Mm. But i would have i don't know i think i would have felt more pressure to perform than i would have got a boost on my performance that's what i would worry about actually. yeah but, and that's why it astounds me when you get sports people mm. like the england team from 1966 like nigel mansell at home like damon hill at home like um you know big playing in front of a german crowd. those guys are exceptional because I genuinely think they did get a kick out of playing from it and they did take something from it and it did elevate their play somehow. Whether it was they got more confidence because they had more people behind them or whether it was pride, whether it was a mixture of those two things, whether they have the innate skill level anyway, but playing in front of a home crowd put more pressure on the other team and they felt like they were the champions because they're playing in front of their home people. I don't know what it is or how to bottle it because I wish I did, I could make a fortune, um, without rebranding their whole industry. Just thought I'd get another digging. Um, but I can't. And so, for me, it comes down to a simple, like, is there a more pressure or is it, or are you boosted more? There's, it's got to be one of those two things. And yet, more, more often than not, it seems teams are boosted. It yeah. feels like they've given a, a leg up, e.g., the t TI. Of course, yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, playing in front of the home, I would have been like a wreck playing that game. And you've got to remember, Samal was 16 at the time, right? Playing in front of a home crowd, you're just like, that's absurd like the amount of pressure you've got to feel or do you go in that with so much confidence borderline arrogance if not full-blown arrogance and just go fuck it don't care what the crowd thinks i'm in a play like and i, I don't know i don't know how you approach it. i have no idea i'd love to talk to charlie i haven't spoken to charlie for a while but i'd love to talk about charlie but what did you talk to what did they say before they went into the final for ti6 like what did they actually discuss or like, ti5 rather um eg one because they seem so chill yeah I see. I I still wonder though. Um, oh, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> it's Friday the thirteenth. It is Friday the thirteenth. We're having all sorts of problems <laughs> yeah. today. Never worked with Sue Joy or with kids or with animals or on the thirteenth of of any. Actually, any that, that brings me back to my point. Su right. Superstition. Okay, superstition. Yeah. Did you I, have any, by the way? I think we well, see. I, I'm very. You, I'm a scientist. So I'm very logical about yeah. everything. But I did do you have anything life. when you played? Did you have no. your mouse pad in a certain way? No, I didn't. Yeah. Okay. You weren't. You weren't like. You know. You didn't get the ruler out and measure how far away it was from your desk. That, or... I don't think that's superstition. So. Okay. Um, well, so there's some science involved. So Craig, yeah. who yeah. intentionally pronounces his name wrong, 
yeah. used to have a template where he, he did, put his yeah. keyboard and mouse and mouse pad. And, but um, I think superstition is rife because we're humans. Yeah. So that means when you believe that there's a fairy tale going on, so right. you're in the ESL1 Cologne Grand <laughs> Final, you're a German <laughs> team, the crowd are behind you, this is your moment. This is the time you're going to win. And if right. you believe that, maybe that's what's giving you a push. Well, I mean, it's... it's um it's effectively the same as getting psychological coaching, isn't it? Because that's what a psychological coach would be telling you. You guys are great. You are really good at this game. It doesn't matter what the crowd think. It doesn't matter what the other team think. It's how you deliver. It's how you play on the day. You should have the confidence in your ability. You've been playing really well recently. You've done this. You've done that. It's the same kind of vibe, isn't it? Yeah. I think so. So maybe you get it without having a psych psychology coach. Yeah. You, you, just, you just get those things. But it's interesting all the same. I, I'm still not... I'm not sold totally on the whole playing in front of a home crowd gives you a boost, but I'm, I'm almost there. And, and for no, sci no scientific reason, more a social psychology reason more than anything else. Because of what you just said, like that whole, I can train my brain that way, right? I can train my brain to think that all trains are late. Or I can train my brain to think I don't care if trains are late because my planning is so good that it won't make any difference. I suppose time will tell. Yeah. Um, and esports people are quite mindful of statistics. Yeah. So, uh, so maybe they'll be asking their fans to cheer a bit less loudly if it doesn't work. What, English fans? Well, yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> oh, but I'm, I'm just They're going to make a lot of noise yeah. at Wembley. What are you on about? Yeah, I think yeah. so. I mean, that's going to be exciting then. So the, um, the Face It Major will be happening what September yeah, late, late September yeah um, so that's the first CS major in the UK it is the first CS, we, we've had two this year we've never had any majors in the UK um, we've been lucky enough to get a Dota major earlier on this year in Birmingham and a CS major this year uh, in London so you know it's when they say it's coming home that's what we were talking about we weren't talking about football or what you were talking about <laughs> we were talking about esports well I guess here's, that will be the test let's see how yeah. uh, Smuya and a uh, deaf yeah, yeah, how, how they're going to do complexity. in September. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, good luck to both of those boys. Let's see what questions we have from sure. chat. <coughs> wow, they're quite long. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, Should we pick a few? Well, the, the, I mean, we, one from uh, Christopher James Watts asking, what can smaller regions do to grow their own esports scene, such as how can we in South Africa help to grow the industry locally? <coughs> Yeah, um, we spoke about South Africa, I think, last time. Um, I'm a obviously a very passionate advocate of South African esports, um, having been down there a few times and got lots of friends down there. We represent lots of talent down there, and we've got clients down there as well. So, um, I would say it's it's in terms of helping yourselves, you already are. I think the one thing I do see a lot of South African people doing that we also see a lot of UK people doing. It's a very similar kind of vibe. Is that you tend to be quite um, or rather too sceptical sometimes of stuff that comes out from new people. And, and I think it's right to question new entrants into esports, no doubt about that. But I think at the same time, when, you're, when you've got genuine people, for instance, Barry Lozada, who's working with Metal State and bringing some crazy good production levels to, uh, to South African esports, when someone does something like that, get on board. Even if, you're not, if it's not your game or you know, they're supporting female gaming and you disagree or they're doing um, a different type of format, whatever it might be, try, try not to be too negative about it because if you're going to be negative about the stuff that you do get down there, how the hell are you ever going to get anyone to come down there from the likes of Face It or Multi Play or ESL or, or anyone else for that matter? Like, they're not going to come because they just see this negative aspect. And I'm not saying just ignore all the flaws, far from it. But I'm saying support your local grassroots scene, support the likes of Versus Gaming, support ESL and Questy, support Metal State, support all of the people that try and provide you with something, whether it be tournaments, whether it be platforms, whether it be writing, whether it be websites, whether it be uh, blogs, YouTube videos, whatever it is, try and support each other. You're such a small scene, but such a passionate scene, that if you can support each other and make that grow even bigger and, and, and invite other people into that rather than being exclusive, be inclusive, then I think you have a chance to show everyone else outside of South Africa just what a cool scene is. Yeah, and, and that goes for goes for everything. Goes yeah. for UK scene. Goes for Australian scene, New Zealand scene, uh, Jamaican scene, Ghanaian scene. Wherever scene it is, it's the same principles, right? We're all very bad sometimes at not being, you know, being too uh, critical. I think. Yeah. Of stuff. 
So, uh, Dmitry Ocelot, which, amazing name, by the way, Ocelot. What's his I name? Dmitry Ocelot. Oh. Uh, so, we in North Africa want to grow too, but the government yep. doesn't care about esports and Valve don't care about Africa. Uh, so, we have to stick with European servers. So, yep. uh, how, how, I mean, that's it's a very broad question, is how, how do you get government to care about these things? Uh, maybe that's not something you it's, can that's change. for another show maybe yeah. but I, I think in general dealing with the valve stuff i think valve do care but valve valve are a business let's let's be brutally honest about it they're not here to um make friends or make you happy that's not their job their job is to make money they are a business and you have to accept that and then you can try and treat them differently and see them in a way that allows you to understand how to get them interested in your scene so if their goal is to make money because they're a business and that's what they're there to do, then how do they do that from your region? They do that from having a better player base. So your job, whether you like it or not, and if you want to improve your region, then you like it, is to get more players playing the game that you love or that they love. And so it's about going out. It's about intriguing people. It's about making them interested, whether that's through video content or footage that you provide or being entertaining or commentating or playing or getting team tournaments or whatever it might be. Back in the day, he, he and I, I'm looking at Sujoy right now, he and I would, because we wanted stuff to grow, we would run our own tournaments. We would literally set up stuff so that other players could come and enjoy it. And it was a lot of time and a lot of effort, and it was a pain in the ass, frankly. But we did it because we knew we wanted to grow our game because we loved the game that we played and we wanted it to be bigger. And we weren't the only ones doing it. There were hundreds of people doing it, and that's why it proliferated, and that's how esports started. So you have to think in those broad stroke terms of what's going to turn Valve on. Well, what's going to turn them on is if there's a bigger player base. And if there's a bigger player base, hopefully you can then go to them and go, look, guys, we've got all these players, and we're playing on European servers, but just give us a server right now. Then they give you a server. From there, you can then start thinking about, okay, now we have our local servers. Maybe we should be a region. Maybe we should have qualifiers. Well, let's lump in with Ghana and Morocco and Libya and Jordan and South Africa, for example, and we'll form a group of people that say, we want qualifiers, Valve. Give us qualifiers. And keep doing Keep building. And I, and I know it's frustrating. And I know that when you... Look at me, you'll probably just say, well, it's easy for you to say that. You live in the UK, you're not geographically challenged, you're not being ignored by Valve. Yeah, sure. And actually, we have the opposite effect. We're bone idle and we're lazy. We don't do any of those things, yet we get given everything and we're still crap at it. So keep going, keep hammering away at it, keep being positive, keep being passionate. I think, I think that's the challenge is because if you're in one uh, country where you don't get the right kind of support, you're you're looking longingly jealously yeah. at, at the places that have everything yeah. and have events and they have um they have servers and they have yeah. like sponsors and local support from government local support from publishers um it's hard but but this is the world and like you say i, yeah. I spent small steps well i spent from the years of about 18 to, to 22 just non-stop pushing things that didn't exist, like building a website. And it's like, why don't we have good news here? It's like, let's, let's make a news website. Or when you know someone does make a good news website, let's support it, let's yeah. talk to them, let's build their community, get involved in local. How old is it reality this year if we include XSR? 15, 16 years? A bit longer? 18. 18 now? Yes. Jesus. Okay, yeah, so it's... There's, a, there's a website called esreality.com, go and check it out, it's all about 1v1 FPSs, mainly about Quake, because uh, uh, he was from Quake. This man set that up, it was 18 years ago, crazy. Well, yeah, and but you before, need to do that stuff. Before then, I was, there was, I there was, was making stuff content, as well, yeah. Yeah. you know, I was setting up tournaments. Yeah. And you were writing in um, magazines, doing yeah, interviews. I, doing everything spreading I could. Spreading the gospel. This was, this was before I was Absolutely. making money yeah. from it. I was yeah. a banker or a yeah. student, and you have to keep hammering yeah. <laughs> a, yeah i think a, that's a, the common link as well isn't it? it between all the people that helped start esports on its road was that none of us made any money from it i think it, there's a common misconception now where people think they can just come into the industry and make 50 grand a year yeah. doing what they love to do and, it, and it's not as straightforward as that you, you i'm not saying you have to earn your spurs and you, ha and you have to you know do stuff for nothing and then you get paid. It's not like that, but what I'm trying to say is that sometimes if you want it that badly, then it doesn't matter whether you get paid or not. It's, you're just gonna have to get on and do it. Yeah. Um, okay. Should we do one more? One more question and then right. I think we'll have to tune out. Uh, but I'm, I'm adding more time because- Yeah, because we, we, we had a little bit delayed. So we've got delayed. probably like five, 10 minutes. 
Uh, sorry, I just want to. I want to vet the question. Actually, She's vetting the questions. Oh, I was going it. to, but actually, we've got the beautiful <laughs> Tim, who's online right now, See? reading questions out for me. So big it up, my like... man Tim. I've been watching Ali G over the weekend, but I don't know why I watched Ali G again. It's just an amazing film. I loved it. So uh, Vincent Cogler, I don't know how to pronounce that. I think I've got that right. Uh, has asked I O C and G A I S F. I yes. imagine that's another. It's the Global International okay. Esports Federation. Esports or regular e- esports, it, but it's a sports federation. Yeah. Okay, collective. Ah, now they yeah. are inviting esports and they sports are. representatives to meet in the Olympic capital, yes, they Lausanne, are. in Switzerland, for the esports forum. What are our expectations from it, and what message do we want? Esports okay, so the first expectations I have are that when the IOC chairman says they are not looking to include esports in the next Olympics by using this forum, that means I don't give a crap about this next thing they do. Why would I? Yeah. <laughs> what's the what's the point in caring about what these you wanna, politicians have to say? Well, here's the because thing, they're not talking about including esports in the next Olympics. Well, if they're not talking about that, then I don't want to talk to them because that's what we should be talking about right now. Now, I don't particularly care if it goes in the Olympics or not. They seem to care far more than we do, by the way. Like I ran a poll a year ago, 67% of people said they didn't care if it was in the Olympics and actually didn't want it in the Olympics either. And I'm with them. I don't care if it's in it. We've got our own ecosystem. I mean, it's, it's time that we stopped pandering to other sports to let them into us like they need us more than we need them now like i don't care about the olympics i really don't i loved watching it last time it was in london it was brilliant it was well put on i love mo farrow and what he's achieved i think all the sports people the men and women and the disabled people involved in all of those different sports are incredible people nothing nothing to do with that whatsoever I also happen to think that someone like Simple or Cold Zero or Ryan Hart or any of the amazing people involved in our world are also capable of incredible things that make me go, wow, right? I don't need the Olympics to tell me that. I don't need the Olympics to give me that story. We've already got it. We've got ESL One Cologne. We've got Cadavica Stadium. We've got the majors coming to the UK. We've got Face It. We've got Dreamhack. We've got Starladder. We've got all incredible people all around the world, both North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, everywhere doing incredible things that make me smile, that give me enjoyment, that, that promote my passion, right? for doing what we're doing. I don't need the Olympics to prove any of that. I am 100% with you, but... <laughs> I, 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 feel like, I feel like we have to... I get a bit fired about it, it because it, it just feels like they're like, oh, well, uh, we're the Olympics and uh, we'll have to vet you first before we let you in. Uh, uh, fighting games, <laughs> guns and stuff. <laughs> Can't be doing with guns and things. <laughs> fluffy, fluffy, cuddly thing. Yeah, no problem. We'll have those in. They can come in. 1v1 games with uh, futuristic sci-fi tanks. They're okay. We'll have those as well. And it just feels pompous as fuck to me that these Olympian people come in and they think they can include these. I don't care! Here's, here's my view, is that they're, they're losing, they're, they're becoming more and more irrelevant as yes. time goes on. And every time yes. I, I'll, I'll visit my parents' house and they'll have the TV on. I've never watched TV. Anymore. No, not so do I. So I'm seeing these people who are the stars and the celebrities, the ones who are invited on talk shows and so on. It's like... I, I don't, don't know any of them. Yeah, and I don't care about nope. them. Here's the I, thing. I would much rather watch a show with you on it, with Toby One, with Henry G Machine and Borg and... Those are my celebrities. Yeah, you know? sure. Not not the guys who are famous on but it's, TV. But it's not even before. about that for me. It's I'm okay with the sportsmen and women doing amazing things, and they do genuinely do incredible things. They train super high. Literally, uh, just watch Bolt, right? Go and watch the documentary Bolt, and watch what he went through to become as good as he got. It's unbelievable amount of preparation and time and effort and sacrifice. But. There are the same things that our people go through. Mm. Olaf Meister's just gone through a terrible injury, again, having to rest again, right? This guy's a world-class player. He does things in game that no one even dreamed of when he did them the first time, right? He's an unbelievable talent in this space. And yet, he doesn't get the same glorification that you say Bolt gets? Screw that. He deserves it, as far as I mean. He doesn't need an Olympic medal to prove that he's a world-class player or that he's a champion for phase. He doesn't need any of those. And I don't need him to have any of those things. For me, the Olympics and the reason, the only reason that we should get involved is mainstream relevancy. And that's if we want more viewers. And I totally understand that, which is why I'm not absolutely against us being involved in the, in the Olympics. But, but my God, stop being so pompous, you assholes. Like, we don't need you. You need us. Because no one under 30 is watching the Olympics anymore. 
No one, and no one aspires to be an Olympic champion. Well, very few people aspire to be an Olympic champion in any discipline anymore. They care about esports stuff. The youngsters now, they have a different thought. Right? They might want to be a professional athlete, and that's cool. I've got no issue with that either. They might want to be a professional swimmer and win a gold medal at the Olympics. Fantastic. Go and do that, please. But don't, don't sit there educating us on why we should adopt your principles. Like You've had your own corruption scandals and your own drug scandals and everything else. Like, keep it over there, thanks very much. I, I think, I mean, partly when I'm speaking about this, and I agree with you on most of those topics, it is a bit of pride as well because Absolutely they didn't is. want us when no, we were again, they, they, they said no to us many years ago so bugger off now yeah. now, we're, so, now so, we're important but, but pride's not a good reason no it isn't but here are some good reasons why I'm not over the moon about mainstream say IOC wanting to recognise esports is that I've we've both been involved over the years and we've seen people come in just to steal a bit of Yes. Esports magic and yeah. splendor and the, the fans mm, get fat, it fat wallets off it. It never works out no. actually because when they come in without appreciating the authenticity of the community, you end up making huge mistakes. You end up thinking, oh, well, this is great, but we should change it to, to this model which fits our commercial structure better. And you know what? Esports doesn't work like that. You can't just come in and take bits and pieces of it. You have to understand your audience. You have to provide them entertainment that works for them, that's authentic to, to what they grew up with and what they're, what they're expecting on a stream. So I've seen so many companies come in and mess it up thinking that they're more important than this and they just want to uh, yep. come and give us validation. Do you know who the, um, the best person you can talk to online and that's in the public eye in esports right now is Siskoots? Because not only is Scott an avid gamer and an avid passionate fan of esports and someone who's been involved in it a long time. But he's also worked at eight Olympics and I think four or five, maybe even six World Cups as well. So he's seen the inner workings of what the Olympics runs like and how it works and all the corruption, no doubt, as well. And he understands that mentality. And probably the only person that we have in esports at both high levels of those two things that could probably cross the bridge and explain why. I'd love to see a piece from him, actually, that just explains why it's such a bad thing. Because I'm pretty sure he would agree with me. It's, it's not a good thing. Like, we should not be getting into bed with the Olympics. Yeah. I, I As I said, the only reason I can see it that it would be good for us is mainstream relevancy. Yeah. And we don't need it. We'll get there in the end anyway. I, I think we are the new mainstream. And on that bombshell... <laughs> <laughs> He's stealing lines now as well, I love it. Where, where's that from, actually? From Top Gear, I think, isn't it? No, yeah, it's, it's, it's Clarkson. It is Clarkson. Clarkson, he used to say at the end of Top Gear. Yeah, yeah. well, thanks and for And on that bombshell, in. we're both fired. <laughs> are we, are we going to be done, done for copyright? No, I don't think Definitely coffee copy time. Yeah. It is coffee time, so thanks so much for tuning yes, in to the you. second podcast. Uh, we're, I'm sorry about the technical issues. We are... We, we just rebuilt again this morning. Um, it's, so the, it's the 13th, Friday the 13th. That's yeah. what we're just going to blame Excuses on that. Excuses aside, we'll, yeah. we'll have it all nailed for next time. So thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you soon. Yeah.